Good morning. Yay for the 9.30 session. <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me again to, uh, uh, to MIG. This is my first MIGS. Uh, so I've been having fun with the snowstorm yesterday. It reminds me of going to school in Chicago. It reminded me why I don't really miss winters as much as I thought I did. I was waxing nostalgic for them living in Seattle, and it's like, oh, right, it gets really cold. Um, so this is uh, a sort of deep dive on a, a couple of different things, um, sort of based on uh, technology's impact on what we do creatively, and then a specific case study where I'm going to talk a little about 3D audio and some of the um, limitations that, uh, that we have for, uh, for that. First, of course, the disclaimer, by entering in by your presence here, you consent to be photographed, filmed, then or otherwise recorded. Your entry constitutes consent to such photography, filming, and or recording to have all used in any all media throughout the universe in perpetuity <laughs> of your appearance, voice, and name for any purpose whatsoever in connection with the production of a project entitled Tech Tools and Trends in Game Audio. <laughs> now, if you're a subscriber to the multiverse theory, uh, which is late, lately a cool thing in um, contemporary physics, uh, perhaps there's an exception here we can walk through since this is only one universe. Um. So I'm going to start with one of my favorite quotes of the industry ever. This was John Carmack at GDC 2004, um, basically saying, you know, audio, that's a solved problem. Uh, another one that basically could be done right now is audio. If anybody wanted to spend all the resources that we have today uh, in terms of using the GPUs for it and all the floating point processing power, audio could be done. I mean, we could go ahead and have all the head modeling, all the, ra you know, the radiosity style sound transfer through very complex environments, and we certainly have the, you know, the sample rate and the, you know, and the bit depth for all of that. But it just doesn't really pay off in the current generation of things to devote that much effort to it. But <laughs> given a couple more, you know, a couple more turns of the processor generations, you know, audio will just be done. Well, seeing as we're now a couple processor turn generations around uh, since then, audio's just done. All right, thanks. Um, whoops. Obviously, we have some issues with that here, and. From t in fairness to John, from, from his perspective, a graphics programmer, one of the most brilliant graphics programmers who has ever lived, um, that's what he thinks of when he thinks of game audio. I have a sound, it propagates around, it models off the ears, it goes through a doorway, it diffuses around, I can model that the way I model light when I'm doing geometry and physics and I can uh, do that. And I think one of the big problems there is that it really... Um, obviously simplifies a lot of what it is that, that we try to do in game audio that maybe they don't have direct analogous problems uh, in physics. And at the time um, of this quote, I was actually ironically giving a talk on tools and how tools um, were essentially the bottleneck to what we were being able to do. Um, we had come off, uh, uh, we had shipped Xact in uh, for the original Xbox, which is kind of uh, one of the early prototype of the content tool, game engine sort of thing. I remember s I saw Wise for the first time, I think in 2003, about that same time, and I was thinking, oh, this is exact like five years from now. I, I've gone to a lot of GDCs. They all f are fuzzed together in my memory. I remember that moment very, very well when I first saw Wise. Um, and so in some of the ways, unlike graphics, I think we our technology is a lot more driven by what we're enabled to do, not what's capable of being done. And it's, so it really has been a tools issue for a long time. Um, and this, these technologies have always had an am impact on what we end up doing, um, though we might not always realize it exactly at the time. And that's not a bad thing that the technology is informing us uh, in terms of what we do or affecting the kind of creativity that we're able to do uh, right throughout history, I mean, if you look at this, this is a harpsichord. When the harpsichord was around, people wrote music that was like this. What can a harpsichord do? A harpsichord does not do dynamics well. Uh, the reason you have multiple keyboards in a harp harpsichord are to be able to essentially have different volume levels. Uh, harpsichord also have sometimes stops that give you like a loud or soft uh, thing there. But of course, what happened was that we created this new instrument that could play both 
loud, soft and loud, the pianoforte, and it totally changed the kind of music the composers were composing and people were listening to. And that was the sort of the birth of the Romantic era. You could not create this kind of music really on a harpsichord. First of all, a harpsichord can't, the mechanics of the harpsichord don't allow this kind of virtuosity. Um, and obviously the dynamic expression and so on. Of course, that's not the only instrument. Um, obviously, we've you know, had uh, guitars around for a long time. I should have lived 300 years, 400 years ago. I love this kind of music. Um, and we kept thinking, well, if only we had a way of making this guitar louder, we could have the same kind of experience, only it would be louder now and we could have it in front of more people. You probably know where this is going. Um, well, we did have a way of making it louder, and we said, the engineer said, hey, just make sure you don't turn it up too loud or else the sound will distort. And that's bad, you don't want that. Um, so, same basic instrument, the way what technology did to them, in, you know, had a pretty big influence on what people made with it. And then there's this thing. Oh, I wasn't supposed to put up the Just Touch This yet. All right. This is from 1990. This. Sampling had just kind of hit the mainstream. Can't touch this. And obviously this totally changed Can't music making, this. you know, in the last uh, 27 my, years. My, my, my music me, so okay, maybe I didn't want to live uh, 300 years ago. Um. And in games, that's obviously been the case as well, right? This is uh, one of the examples from guy, the guy had yesterday, right? Nowhere is technology's impact on creativity more prevalent or more evident than in what we do for game audio. Um, where is this one? What that is, um, there was a speech synthesis chip by Texas Instruments, and uh, David Thiel was trying to find some way of you know, putting pseudo text on the screen for this cute little character. And what he ended up doing was seeing what would happen if I just threw random numbers at this thing. And that became uh, Qbert. Um, the 6851 has a more common name. It's otherwise known as the SID chip. Um, obviously, that's got a very, very iconic sound to it. This is a piece by Rob Hubbard. Who could get more out of this ship than anybody else who ever has tried to do this stuff? Whoops. Sorry. PowerPoint issue there. Um, so obviously, at, at that time, game audio kind of looked a lot like this. Right, the tools we had were you had a uh, you had a compiler or you had an assembler. Uh, we didn't even use C. C was you know that fancy person's language. Um, so you had to be able to write really low-level code, and that's the classic asteroids, Defender, Robotrons. Those are brilliantly conceived algorithms that do wacky, wild things with like you know 500 bytes of data uh, to make those sounds. Um, we eventually got a little bit more civilized, and we had these things called note lists, which is like a MIDI-like implementation. Um, but the main thing was is that music, game music, was very really melodically driven. And why is that? You know, that's what the chips were good at, right? If you don't, if you, you know, Bach was very good at do doing this. If he had a really good recorder player, he would write challenging recorder pieces. If his recorder player wasn't so good, he didn't really write such difficult recorder parts because he knew that that wouldn't be able to play it very well. Um, now, obviously, one thing that these chips are not that great at doing is creating sort of sustained emotional impacts that uh, you can do with a live orchestra, except maybe for Rob. Rob did manage to get some really kind of cool emotive sounds um, out of there. So the tools, obviously, we had pitch, time, harmony, form. Game chips could do those re actually really, really quite well. Uh, again, the thing it really couldn't do was uh, timbre. 
And this got us a lot of kind of interesting things. Um, there was a uh, pinball machine that I worked on back in 89 that uh, used a lot of these, uh, you know, took advantage of the fact that we had very low level access to synthesis chips. Um, and as generating all the stuff on the fly, like Guy was talking about yesterday with his Peggle 2 talk, we're able to do things like have transitions on beat, bar, half bar boundaries. Uh, the sound effects uh, at appropriate times would realize what the harmony of the underlying background music was and would transpose itself uh, to that. We had some sound effects that would be quantized to musical subdivisions. In particular, the pop bumpers were quantized to 16th notes. Um, we had the music uh, directly driving visual gameplay effects. Uh, on pinball machines. I, I like pinball machines because I think of them as the, ult the original um, casual game, right? Uh, I think that's why games like Peggle 2 work so well, is these kind of machines are very, they're very fluid, they're interactive, they have these awards, little sequences at the end of each ball. We actually had musical commands we could embed into our scores which would directly flash the lights on the play field. And that way we could have tight syncopated hit points which would automatically uh, fire off the lights. Uh, you know, the, the scores would send the beat and boundary information to the game. And even at a cup, uh, occasionally we would have the game would literally wait for a musically appropriate place to continue going on. And you can kind of get that. I think I have to ex escape out of slideshow mode to do that and drag this over to the other window. There we go. So the thing I want you to watch for is that I put the score up here. You'll see at the end of the ball, you'll see these little bonus countdown things go on, which is all very synchronized with the score. Where'd my mouse go? So within that little sequence there, the ball ended two at a two beat measure boundary. We transitioned to the little end of ball music. The game waited until another two beat boundary. It started to put up those and again, that could go from anywhere from just one X up to I think about six or 10 X or something like that. So very analogous to uh, the, the stuff that um, Guy was showing yesterday. So there, the syncing sound to picture, and Guy and I were talking about this before, is something that is such a heavy, important part of traditional media, linear media, that we d haven't quite gotten that down in games yet. And a lot of it is because of the tools just really aren't there to really uh, do us um, justice for those yet. So that was that. Um, so 2000, 2001, uh, in my opinion, the most important innovation in game audio occurred. Uh, now, my timing's slightly different than guys on that. Um, I claim it's the, the DVD, so a little bit later in the consoles than it was in PC. Now, the, the game consoles, PlayStation uh, and Sega Saturn, were CD-related or CD-based. And I did, you know, a few games uh, where we had, you know, real music um, on CD. But what happened is really quickly after the, f the launch games came out, Game developers realized, oh wow, there's a lot of stuff I can put on that CD. Um, uh, the first game that I did that had 3,000 lines of dialogue was a PlayStation game. And so uh, because a CD is really not that big, it only holds about 680 megabytes, pretty quickly game CDs filled up with other stuff and music was relegated to, to MIDI. Uh, the first Madden for PlayStation, most of the music is MIDI music because of all the dialogue from John Madden. Um, so it is, again, as Guy talked about yesterday, that was a, a big sea change for us. Um, you know, tech giveth, tech taketh away. Uh, certainly the production values went through the roof and you know, nobody would necessarily lament too much the old, I, no, I take that back, lots of people lament the old days. Um, but obviously in interactivity and synchronization went down. So kind of ironically here, we got this awesomely better technology 
which enabled us to do a lot fewer things and try a lot fewer things and be a lot lazier in, in what we were doing. So that's one example of tools and tech Im improving, changing, having a direct impact. Uh, I mean, it literally changed the industry, not just the content of the games, but the business of the industry and who could do it and what kind of skills were needed. It, it was a, that's why I, I that, that is the, the DVD was, I believe, the most titanic shift in game audio. Um, so another case where sometimes our tools let us, lead us a little bit astray and I'm guilty as anybody else about saying we, we should um, stick randomization in our game. Randomization is, our tools make randomization really easy. And it makes it easy for a couple of reasons, but, you know, and it does make things better, and I've given lots of talks, and Guy has, and Simon, everybody here has, about adding randomization to the sound. But it really is a cheat. It's a, it's a poor man substitute for what we're really trying to achieve. Um, and what... When we have a random event, in a random sound in a game, I mean, there, there's nothing random about the physical world. There's nothing random about the virtual world. It really is an implied variation in physics that maybe is just unexposed by the engine. Um, we have a variable explosion sound because the physics engine isn't going to keep track of how much gunpowder is in this particular you know, piece of ordnance and um, you know, how fast was the wind blowing in what direction or what were the variations in the shell casing of the bomb. For that kind of stuff, by all means, let's go whole hog and have random variations because it's implied variations in physics that the game is never going to model. But for a lot of other things, um, you know, just random containers just make randomization too easy uh, and multi-sounds as well. Um, as much as I love them, I stuck them in Exact. They're an important tool, but we re really should just say sometimes to random containers and maybe um, again, the tools make it really easy to do this, so we kind of find ourselves doing it a lot. Um, well, what we really want is more physics-influenced audio, and the tools really don't lend us the ability to do physics-influenced audio very easily or conveniently. Yes, you can have RTPCs, and you can set things up. Oh, it's a lot easier just to put stuff in a random container. Um, and as much as awesome as these tools are, sometimes you just need to code. Um, you know, occasionally conversations will come up where it's like, yeah, middleware has solved the issue. Game audio is done, right? Just like John Carmack said. Um, we've eliminated, we have a nice firewall between programmer and sound designer, and sometimes that just is not, not the case. Uh, and the game I just finished uh, last month is a great example of that. I have a crowd sound, and the crowd, you, you, you can't have a crowd sound just be a crowd with a knob on it. Now, my crowd sound does have a knob on it, but it is a lot, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, what my crowd sound really is, is a couple of bass crowd sounds, which are looping and may fire off at different times, and they each have intensity knobs that we've tied to RTPCs, yeah, yeah. But it's also a series of one of events, um, and also the instructions on how do you actually turn that knob. When do you decide? And so I wrote this spec, which, you know, for how the crowd sound should be created, and it reads a lot like a computer program, right? If the ball is not in the red zone, when teams line up, set the intensity to 100. When hiked, add 100 more. Uh, for each second the play runs, add 20. For each yard the ball progresses down the play field, add another 20. If the ball goes backwards, do not subtract. It's a computer program. It happens to be written in a document and I gave it to the programmer, and the programmer implemented these things. Um, you know, chainsaw Massacre, when the Chainsaw Massacre mode happens, call React to Cool Event Loop. With each chainsaw kill, increase crowd intensity by 50. When mode is over, stop the Cool Event Loop. Lower the crowd intensity to the value it was before the massacre started. These are in the spec. Again, what, this is the computer program. You, you could not conveniently do this in a current game audio middleware tool without jumping to a scripting language. Sometimes that's all you want. Um, so have, have the tools lulled us into complacency? Is John Carmack basically correct? You know, is game audio, how, you know, how are we done? Um, with things like head mo you know, modeling, he called it, which really, really meant individualized HRTF, and radiosity calculations. Um, does that mean 3D audio is done, right? If we were to just solve these things, 
does that mean audio is done? And so I wanted to take a little bit deeper dive into this particular aspect just as an example of something, um, and also because it's kind of topical with the amount of VR stuff going on these days. And so let's dive a little deeper into 3D audio and VR. And I'm going to start by playing a little game. And I need a volunteer. Yes. I need you to sit in this chair. And I need you to close your eyes. And we're going to be on the honor system here. So this is a very simple game. It's a game that usually works. Um, it's called the snap your finger and point game. The rules are not too complicated. I'm going to snap my finger, and you're going to point to where I my finger snapping is. Ready? B I'll make a big, big gesture. Bigger gesture for that one. That's actually very good. Thank you. That's it. That was fun. <laughs> so... I call this a fail. Um, in 70% of the time, uh, and if you go to, I have a, did this at GDC in front of a couple hundred people, and there was a much more pliant subject. About 70% uh, of the people, when you snap here, will point here. Um, you, I snapped here, and he pointed about here. I mean, actually, that's not a fail. That's a good 30 degrees off. Um, so it's not quite as much of a fail. But when it, sometimes it's spectacular. They're, you do this, and they're just like this. Um, and we've all heard about, you know, what are the, big th what are the three things in 3D audio? I'm not going to go over these. This has been talked about a lot. IID, the sound's louder, uh, louder in one ear than the other ear. ITD, the sound gets to this ear before this ear. HRTF, it's the modeling by our PINA. That's what helps us localize sound in 3D space. And these are the really what John Carmack was talking about. Well, it's really the big three plus one. We add the reverberant field in. That's the radiosity tracing and stuff that John Carmack was talking about. And, you know, we can model this. And if you think about it, though, if we, this is the big three plus one, I call it. Um, if we were to perfectly model this, you know, we're only going to get results at the very best that say, I'm going to have a sound here, and the person's going to think it's over here. Because that's what happens in real life. Um, so the big three plus one is really only a, a part of the story, and actually not a really giant part either. Um, well, it, it's, a, it's a big part. Um, so why is it? Why, why is this particularly gnarly little issue? So let's think about how how we evolved, how, how our eyes work versus how our ears work. And I'm as guilty as anybody else about this. I've, I've given lots of talks going back to the original Xbox days about, oh, when you're doing a video game, the screen is just this small window into the real world, into the, the virtual world. Um, audio through surround sound or uh, 3D opens up the play field to be all around you and kind of implied is the there's a level of detail that we can get from vi watching a scene, and now we can hear an enemy here or behind us or up to the left or 3.9221 meters to the right, 116 degrees azimuth, 3.4 degrees elevation. There's this kind of implication that we can do that with sound. And it kind of matches our, expect our, our experiences as well. We don't we don't think of sound as being something that we're not very good at localizing, even though we're, we're terrible. And one of the reasons that the visual acuity is so good is that if you recall from how uh, eyes work, right, the light comes into our ret our, through our lens and focuses on the back of our eyeball on the retina. Uh, there's rods and cones, there's little light receptor cells, and those light receptor cells are directly connected to neurons. So literally at the back of the eye, there is a picture of the visual world. And literally, that picture is directly stimulating neurons um, that create a map of that. Um, so that's, that's what this uh, little picture up here is, right? I've got a bird, oh, put on the laser pointer. I've got a bird up here. Oops. 
And here's a picture of that bird, literally a picture of that bird, just like filming a camera down here. I've got my cat here. My image of the cat is up here. The brain's, of course, smart enough to turn the world upside down and uh, figure this all out. And our visual acuity is actually uh, pretty good. Uh, approximately one millimeter at six meters. That's 20-20 vision. And so, right, that means that, you know, so it's about six meters apart here. My visual acuity, I can locate Simon's nose within about a millimeter of accuracy. It's, a, it's about one arc minute, um, which is why, um, well, now I can't, but which is why someone with 20-20 vision could read Simon's name on his badge from this far away. Um, our ears are a lot more limited. Uh, there is no kind of direct one-to-one -one mapping between the location of an object in physical space and neurons that fire in our brain. That's, that's not how it works. That's just not how we were designed. Some animals have the ability to do that. Uh, you know, a bat can use echolocation to very precisely target things, although I don't know what the exact acuity of the bat's echolocation is. Um, so the best our ears can do is detect what frequency content is in sound. So again, going back here, uh, the, the, the bird and the, the meow, their sounds are all kind of mushed together into a single waveform that Right, hits our eardrum and goes through the, the, the three drums of the inner ear and ultimately fires off some neurons, which I'll get to in just a second here. But the, it, it, you know, bird and cat are mushed together into a single sonic unit. Um, but we, again, we're not, as, not all hope is lost. Um, we can detect, again, what frequency content is available at any given instant. We can detect changes in that content over time. We also do have two inputs, right? We've got ears on either side of our head, and we can use the difference of the change in temporal activity between those to infer things as well. Uh, that's really about it, though. This is, um, this is the inner ear, the cochlea. This is kind of, think of it as a cochlea unrolled. So it's all coiled up like a snail. The cochlea really does, in essence, a mechanical Fourier transform on sounds. That's its job. It's filled with this fluid at the very entrance of the ear canal. Um, high frequencies will stimulate uh, these little, there are little hair cells in your ears that vibrate. Um, and at the very, very end, only the lowest frequency sounds make it all the way to the end, and so only low frequency sounds will vibrate the nerves, the hairs connected to nerve cells that are at the very, very end of the, the cochlea there. So again, you can kind of see here at 1600, this is part of the cochlea that is being vibrated up at uh, 25 kilohertz, oh sorry, 25 hertz, uh, way down there, it's at the very, very end. And another picture of that is here. Right, I've got, oops. I've got a 100 hertz tone way at the end of the cochlea. This is an unrolled cochlea. In the middle, I got a one kilohertz tone. At the very entrance to the ear connect to the cochlea is where the 10 kilohertz is. And in a complex sound, obviously, there are multiple things being done. That's all our ears can do is do this sort of frequency analysis um, of what's going on. So unlike visuals where we have this mapping, we have to infer what, we have to infer everything from just these little bits of information. Uh, we infer what's making the sound by looking at the frequency content and how it changes over time. That's how I can tell a trumpet from a trombone from a guy yelling, hello. Um, these are simply changes in frequency content over time with deltas. Um, I can obviously use IID and ITD, our brain decodes that. Um, but because we're having to infer the location of the sound from ITD, from HRTF, again, we're, um, 
we're not really very good at doing this in the real world. It'd be cool if we were, we just aren't. And so I think I get a little, little skeptical when something, sometimes the marketing people, guilty as charged, get ahead of ourselves a little bit um, in saying, using our blah, blah, blah plugin, we can accurately position sounds at pinpoint locations in 3D space. It's like, no, you can't. Um, but it's, it's not designed to be, right? Our, our ears were not designed to be a precise sense. Our ears are like our peripheral vision. It's, a, it's an early warning system. Um, right, you're on the plains of this area, right, eaten by the tiger is the prototypical evolutionary uh, example, so I'll stick with it. You're on the tiger, you hear something, you don't see anything, uh, you hear something behind you, the tiger rustling in the grass, you know to get away. Um, or you hear something strange, you then take your highly accurate localized sense, your vision, and you move in the direction of where you heard the sound. And that's kind of how, you know, our senses are supposed to work in tandem like that. It's this early warning system, right? We, we have two senses that are low latency um, and uh, get your attention. Um, again, if you smell something, it takes a long time for the smell to get to you, and obviously touch is proximal. So the early warning senses we have are vision. I can see something far away or I can see something over there. My peripheral vision will detect it and I can know to look and see if it's dangerous. But that only works for half the world. So our ears are the way of mapping the rest of the world approximately so that we can then take our visual sense and really draw attention to it. Um, so, how, so how good are we? And this has actually been measured. Uh, you know, this is not um, this is not new science, as you can tell from the um, highly accurate uh, contemporary drafting visual drafting done by this diagram here. Turns out that how accurate we are in localizing a sound is very dependent upon its location relative to where we are looking. Um, so what this says, this little graph says, the little arrow shows where the sound. Um, stimulus was, the little uh, lines here represent the uh, inaccuracy when people, hu real humans listening to real sounds were asked to specify where the sound came from. So we're the most accurate directly ahead of us. Um, and the most accurate means we're within about seven, seven to eight degrees of error. Uh, which is about 72 centimeters at six meters. So um, basically using hearing alone, I can't pinpoint the location of Simon's nose, but I can kind of tell where his head roughly is. Um, um, and I actually, e even that's within a fairly, fairly big range. It's like I know that you're within two or three seats of in front of me. And if I just listened to him and tried to pinpoint him, my guess would be about that accurate. Over to the sides, it's a quite a bit worse. It's about plus or minus 10 degrees. Right? That, that's pretty huge. Um, behind, it's about plus or minus 5 degrees. So even at the very, very, very best, our ears are three orders of magnitude worse than our eyes in terms of localizing sound. Again, and that's at the very, very best position that we possibly have in terms of our spatial acuity for audio. So that's why, again, all I felt bad. You know, it's been 16 years of I'm talking about using sound to extend the play field with the implication that it's kind of on par with what we see. It's really not, right? It's, it's at best a rough approximation accuracy. Elevation, it gets even worse. Um, the error range for elevation is this whole range here. So if I play a sound directly above somebody, they will be on average within about plus or minus 22 degrees. That's this, right? And again, this is a human being listening to a real sound trying to pinpoint its location. You know, 
all the radiosity calculations in the world that we can do aren't going to be able to really get us much better than we can actually do in the real world. And that's one of the reasons, for example, that Ivan uh, at Microsoft, one of the 3D audio researchers there, really says audio is really 2.5D. That's, how, that's simply how we were designed. And that if we set up our expectations and our systems to really rely on 3D, we're going to be failing a lot of the time. Um, so, and again, here's some more things, uh, plus or minus 10 degrees in elevation. You know, so if, if, if you're doing a game, and I, I tried to do a game, uh, you know, which was, a, I did a whack-a-mole, which used sound cues through HRTF instead of visuals. And I discovered very, very quickly, uh, boy, it's really, really hard to pinpoint the lo location of a sound. Uh, the original gameplay mechanic for the game was play a sound at a random position in space and have the person identify where it is and whack it with their thumb on the screen. And it was impossibly hard, even for me. Uh, after I was training with a lot. So I ended up having to make the game a lot simpler to match the limitations of the human perception that we have when we're doing audio. Um, so that's uh, azimuth and elevation. What about distance? Uh, it turns out we're not so good at distance either. Um, this is uh, mapping human subjects, real sounds. This is not virtualized. This is not somebody's HRTF. Uh, this is play a sound for somebody blindfolded and ask them how far away it is. Um, and you can tell here, the, this line is the real sound source. This line is where we thought the peop people thought they heard the sound coming from. So we tend to kind of compress the distance, right? Sounds that are closer, um, we end up making too, uh, too far away. Sounds that are farther away, we end up making too close. That's also an issue for us if we're trying to use radiosity and um, uh, pure mathematics of simulation uh, to simulate distance, which is one of the things that we, that we use actually to simulate distance. Um, now, what interesting things that have done is people have compared, for example, sighted versus people who are either blind, on late on onset blindness, or blind from birth, um, as well as the difference between things like speech, music, and noise. And generally speaking, we are better at localizing sounds we're more familiar with. And in general, sighted people have better distance perception than non-sighted people, um, people who are blind from birth. And if you think about it, that makes sense, right? We spend our entire lives essentially learning this mapping from what something sounds like to how far away it is. As, I'm as Simon, I pick on Simon a lot. As Simon says something, I hear him giggle. I know kind of what a human giggle sounds like at a certain distance, and that's an important distance cue. If you're blind, you don't have that ability to map that. Now, it turns out blind people do have a fairly good distance perception, sometimes exceeding those of sighted people for within reach grasp. And the theory there is that, that they've used reach grasp as the ability, as a metric by which they can scale and calibrate sound uh, with the image there. Um, so I have a little demo of, uh, of this. There's a demo, it's called uh, Psychoacoustic and Contextual Cues Related to Proximal and Distal Sound Sources. It's a little bit dry, um, but I'll play it for you anyway. Oops. Here we go. There's Professor Grover. It's your old pal Grover. Mm -hmm. And today I'm going to talk to you about near and far. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, little furry Grover, am going to show you near and far. Mm -hmm. Okay, here goes. Mm -hmm. First, this is near. Right here, near. Mm -hmm. Do it once more for you, okay? Okay. This is near. This is far. So, ho 
hopefully you get the idea there. <laughs> um, uh, where's my mouse? That isn't the real name of that video, obviously. Um, <laughs> but it could be. Because uh, what I liked about this video a lot is that um, as Grover goes from near to far, the sound design changed, right? And I, th I think uh, it, it shows off some important cues. It's a little bit tough in a reverberant space. That's all, by the way, you know, never demo a reverb at a conference because the reverberant space of the hall will overwhelm whatever you're trying to show. But even in this video, you could, t you know, the, um, when I play this for students, it's like, please ident you know, well identify what are the things that are different. Okay, um, he's softer as he's farther away, right? That's intensity difference. That's a learned distance thing. Um, he's a little bit more, a little bit more muffled, uh, which is the low pass filtering effect of air. I'm glad that they did the low pass filtering. Um, you know, Sesame Street Workshop knows what they're doing. Um, obviously, the big change is the reverberant field increases quite a bit, and those are very, very important cues. Um, for determining the distance of a sound. Um, there's one other important cue uh, that was there that for the most part people miss, actually two, um, which actually in a lot of ways overwhelm those first ones. Um, Grover was soft, but he was shouting. And that actually, in terms of human voice, that's one of the very biggest cues that we have in terms of distance localization. And I don't care how good your HRTF plugin is. You can't just take a close-up of this is near and put it through a make it sound far away filter and have it sound reliably far away unless he's shouting. Um, but our tools don't let us do this very easily. Our, our tools really easily let us, let me create a 3D bus and I'll put this HRTF on it and I've mapped my distance to my early direct reverberant ratios and I've gone and done it and aren't I proud of myself and distance is done. Uh, no, not really. Um, this, the second cue, by the way, of course, is he was saying, this is far. So he was just telling you where he was. Um, now, an interesting thought experiment, which um, would be, what would happen if at the second one, instead of Grover very loudly saying, this is far, it was a high-pitched voice Grover saying, hello, everybody. Would he be near or would he be far? Or would I have to also make him shout uh, to, be, um, to be far away? I thought it would be a great area for some research student to look at. Um, I think they should use this video. Um, so, but what math do we do? Um, this is a great, uh, and I don't mean to pick on WISE. WISE is awesome. Um, I use it. I've used it on shipping games. Um, image source approach to dynamic early reflections is doing the kinds of radiosity calculations that John Carmack was talking about. And these, I don't mean to downplay them. They're important elements. They give you a feeling of space. Now, it could be argued, have we done the due diligence psychoacoustic research to determine exactly the extent about how important is this math to create a feeling of space versus having just somebody s shout a little bit louder when they get farther away and which is going to give a little bit a more accurate, sorry, I'm wrecking havoc with the poor sound guy by moving my mic. Sorry about that back there. Um, because these techniques obviously are not, are not new. Uh, this uh, image source ref early reflections goes back to this. This is a diagram from the Kendall Martins patent, uh, work that was done at Northwestern University based upon uh, work done prior in the 60s where that's when people kind of realized what our pinna were all about. Um, and we actually had put that, I had the great fortune of studying under Professor uh, Gary Kendall, um, who did a lot of the seminal research in this work. And we actually had a computer program that did this uh, back in 1982 or 83. It was called the Spatial Reverberator. 
Uh, we actually used it. We were, uh, the studio was contacted by, the school was contacted by, I think it was CBS, uh, when they made a remake of the Twilight Zone TV series, they wanted to have 3D audio as part of it. And so we had this system where we could specify, it was we specify a WAV file, though they weren't WAV files, WAV files didn't really exist in that format yet. Um, and we could process them, this through them and do this exact math. And there were some very, very cool demos that, you know, we had a, a buzz saw that even over speakers would come zooming in from the left, go around behind the back of your neck and zoom off into the distance over there. It was really cool. Took a little bit more CPU time uh, than it did now uh, to generate, uh, I think it was 30 seconds of eight channels of spatialized audio. We would set it all up, put in the trajectories and say, compute. And then two days later, we could listen to the wave file that was calculated um, result of the HDF. So it's a little easier now, but it's doing this, this same basic stuff. Um, so again, but even that is only part of it. And so, so what are some of the other hurdles that we have? Well, part of it is that, you know, our, like I said, our ears aren't this thing designed to define the world all around us in and of itself. It really is designed to take everything, it, all the income coming from its senses, as well as everything our brain has learned up to this point of our existence, and using it to create a coherent explanation of the universe around us, right? It, right the, the universe is really the matrix. Um, I'm not saying it's artificial or not, but right, all we have to make up this thing that we call sight and this stuff we call sound, right? Sound is a completely figment of our imagination. It's a simple, simply a arbitrary mapping of vibrating air molecules to something we think of as sound. Um, and so we use all these different pieces of information to try to put together a coherent map. Um, and so it's a very multi-sensual multi-sense uh, phenomenon. And one thing we've learned is that if I hear a bird, the bird's going to be above me in the vast majority of human experience, or an airplane, or a helicopter. That's why we do those in 3D audio demos, is because we bank on the presupposition that up is up, and it makes the up effect better. Um, also, if I don't see an obvious source of a sound, I will localize it behind me. It's called front-back confusion. That's why um, I'm usually confident in giving this demo because seven or eight times out of 10, you snap here and somebody points behind them. You're more likely to get it wrong than it, you are to get it right if you don't uh, see a sound source. Um, so that's one of the reasons why 3D audio demos, for example, sometimes sound better than when you actually put them in the game, right? We, we're picking explicit sound sources that are ripe for 3D audio sound sourcing. They're broadband sound, so the HRTF filters have nice meat to filter into. Um, we play on preconceptions. Uh, trains are supposed to be uh, distant. Uh, we use visuals uh, to emphasize things. Um, Another thing is, is that uh, right, if you're doing a 3D audio demo, 3D audio is the story of the demo. It's focusing your attention and leading you on a path to pay attention to the location of sounds. If you listen to a virtual haircut, um, you know, it really is a little story that asks you to pay attention to the sounds. And it, you know, it subtly or not so subtly says, I'm putting the bag over your head. I'm now going to snip the snippers around you um, over the top of your head. And when somebody says they're snipping scissors over the top of your head, you combine that with uh, HRTF and psychoacoustics, you're going to hear like sound, feel like the sound is coming from over the top of your head. So I would sort of postulate that things like modeling, which I think is what John Carmack was referring to, uh, individu individualized HRTF when he was talking about that, I don't think necessarily means that audio is basically done. Um, and so for 3D audio in particular, I think it's not the big three, I think it's the big seven. Or certainly the big three plus one plus three. Um, preconception, learned behavior, and visual fusion are kind of the missing pieces that we sometimes do in 3D audio. And if we're going to 
complete our tool set, uh, we need to make sure that um, our tools take care of these as well. And in fact, I would almost postulate that in some of these, some cases, the um, perceptual side, the non-physics, the non-John Carmack, what is sound, uh, may in some cases be more important. And to make sure our tools let us do these sorts of things in a way that doesn't lead us to writing melodic scores because of limitations of chip tune, or it's easy to make a random container, so let's make random noises. It's, eas it's too hard to do some of these things, so we don't bother doing them. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a great demo uh, example that was within the last couple of weeks was put on the WISE website, um, which shows a kind of a demo of what I was talking, what I'm thinking about talking about here. Unfortunately, it's a little cumbersome to do it, but what this demo is, and you all should look it up, is it's a demo of um, variable Jeep dialogue. And the way it's set up is, it, what the problem they're trying to solve is if I've got a game and there's, let's say, some dialogue between two characters and they're riding along in this Jeep, if the Jeep is going very slowly and there's not a lot of ambient noise, then the dialogue between the two characters is kind of a normal level of human conversation dynamic. But if the Jeep is going faster or there's, they're being chased by enemies or there's s more noise in the system overall, well, naturally, if I'm trying to talk to Guy and we're in an open-air Jeep and all of a sudden the engine is making lots of noise and there's a lot of wind going on, I'm not simply saying the same words with a louder volume. I'm raising... It, it's not just the quiet wave file, but louder. It's a, actually a different wave file. And if I'm going really, really fast, I need to start shouting at Guy the exact same lines of dialogue. And they actually have a very good demo of this where they've taken uh, the, the bus sounds from the Jeep and I think maybe some ambulance as well, put it through a metering effect. Use that metering effect to drive an RTPC. The RTPC sets a switch value, and then they have three dynamic ranges for each line of dialogue. And they've actually cut it up into little sections so that no section is longer than like three or four words. And so as the, the, uh, the demo is playing and the Jeep is going slowly, it's rendering out the, the, right, the RTPC, looks at the volume level of the Jeep and says, oh, I'm going to set the switch container to pick the piano that the soft utterance is. But if the RTPC, make, uh, because of the volume of the Jeep, um, gets too high, then it switches from the soft uh, normal dialogue to the mezzo forte version of the dialogue and ultimately to the fortissimo version of the dialogue. And that kind of stuff is going to add a lot more realism, I would postulate, than perhaps a, an awesome HRTF distance model or something like that. Uh, obviously, the two of them combined are the best way to do it. But you can imagine the exact same thing going on, but not instead of using Jeep volume, tie that into distance as well. So, yeah, let's be careful not to uh, let our tools lead us down the garden path too much. It's really easy to get comfortable with these tools and feel a little limited by them. Um, let, let's have more of the scribbling in the optical track of the, uh, of the system. And then if somebody comes up with cool things to do with the optical track of the system, let's make sure that the tools let people easily scribble on the optical track and do cool stuff. Um, I do think there is a ton of work out here for masters of PhD thesis to look at what is psychoacoustically important, right? How accurately do I have to measure the walls in this room to have it be in a, a, a to have it the space feel real for virtual or augmented reality? Uh, do I have to be within, you know, centimeters, or is within meters okay, or does it vary based on the size of the room? Um, how much of distance is tone of voice? Are there things analogous to the human voice that we can look at, or are or is the human voice unique? in its our ability to judge distance based upon by the timbre of the voice and so on. So um, I forgot to put up a question slide. So um, 
I've got like five minutes left if I have any questions. Yes, in the back. That's correct. If, if you are really going to, the, the system I was talking about where we have a soft version of the dialogue, a mezzo forte version of the dialogue, and a very loud version of the dialogue, yes, you actually have to go record three separate performances at three different dialogue intensity levels, um, which just means our game dialogue went from 50,000 lines to 150,000 lines. Woo-hoo. That's correct. Yay! Um, that's correct. And uh, I'm sure now that the sag after contact is all set, we have a whole other s- uh, series of stuff to do at it. it. It's time intensive. It, um, but again, if, if tools from the script to the implementation let us do it, we'll do it and we'll have better games. If the tools are clumsy and inconvenient to use, I think that'll be a, a big hindrance on it. So yeah, that was, that was a good question. Yeah, it, it's more work. Here we go. Microphone. Does uh, accuracy above improve if it's multiple times and the, the person's allowed to turn just slightly? Yeah, that's a right? great question. Um, did you have a follow-on? Or no, I that's it. Okay. Uh, the answer is, yeah, I was kind of cheating. Um, the cheat was that I played a short sound once only. Um, one of the big cues that we do have in, um, cert- especially in front-back differentiation, is head movement. And if I had jingled my keys with a continuous sound source instead of having a single sound source, uh, people can generally do much better. Although uh, some of one of those diagrams um, was actually on con- consistent spoken word. So it's, we're still not that good, but we do definitely use head movement to improve localization, yeah, and the dog is tilted. And, as well as tilt. Right, as soon as you as soon as you move your head at all, you now have more than two ears. Two you now have four ears, or six ears, or eight ears, or however many ears that you have. Where you and the, these head movements actually can be very subtle. You know, tiny, very almost imperceptible head movements. Um, but it but it also is a very powerful thing because it's uh, you know we've all had I think the experience of we're know, home alone and the house is quiet and we hear something, what's the first thing you do? You turn your head and you hope that it makes that sound again because you only have a vague idea where it came from or, you know, or a, uh, for, you know, a mouse sound or something like that. Um, you turn your head and that's why s- sound can be so scary too because you, your, your proximal, your, your, your distance warning system has gone off. I heard a sound. I don't see it. It's somewhere over there. I don't know where. And please make another sound so I can get another take on it or see if I can see something on it. So it is something that we, we can obviously play with and, and manipulate people very well with. But yeah, if you move your, your the, either the sound source is continual or enough time to move your head, you people do better, but still not perfect. So maybe that's something game designers or uh, sound designers can play with. It's like, yeah, let me b- play this a couple of times, give them the chance to... A false sense of security, yeah. Right. L- lull them into... Just yeah. Use play that psychoacoustic thing to... Yeah, if you're going to have a gameplay that's play a short sound once and the gameplay mechanic requires them to yeah. accurately localize it, that's not a recipe for fun gameplay. But if you give a couple hints or have a helicopter hover over here and let them zero in on it, that, that'll be a lot more likelihood of success. Yes. Um, the Grover example was really interesting because it seemed like you actually need different recorded source to get the far away uh, sound. I was wondering if you're aware of any efforts in like machine learning or AI to generate that kind of sound because when you look at like style transfer in images, I don't know if you've seen stuff where they can take like my drawing and turn it into a Van Gogh. Um, I, I was wondering if you're aware of anything along that line in audio source generation through AI. Um, Adobe is doing some work on this. Uh, right, it, it's kind of a holy grail because, frankly, that means once, once you have that, can you get rid of voice actors? <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's something people are working on, but it's, it's such a different... I mean, in, in, until we solve the problem of completely realistic speech synthesis, uh, which we're not super close to. Um, I mean, yeah, we can get 90% of the way to there pretty pretty well, but it's that extra little bit that is always the, the elusive bit. Um, 
Yeah, except for the stuff from that Adobe is doing, which is sort of the scary, you know, make people say arbitrary things and have it be convincing. Um, I'm not aware of big inflection change uh, software. Google did buy a company about yeah. four or five years ago called yeah, um, it, it was really good. Yeah, it was, it was very good. It was, it was very good at stitching sounds together <coughs> and mapping phonemes and having basic inflections, but the kind of... <coughs> yes, couldn't you? I think with that tool, you could, I you could draw inflections, so, but it still takes human effort to design it. Yeah, and, and it was also, it, it didn't... It, it, that had limit very yeah. strict limitations. It, it could go from a rendering like this to a rendering like this. So it turns a right. question into an answer. But it did not do that kind of shouting yeah. mm -hmm. example. That's such a different timbre, I think. Um, but, but yeah, great PhDs out there. Go, go, go to it. Go get them. The company was Phonetic Arts. Phonetic Arts, yes. They were bought by Google, and I haven't heard anything from them since. Well, Google is getting better at voice recognition and, yeah, <laughs> and text-to-speech, speech speech speech, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you were um, mentioning maybe we should start to work away from random containers and uh, start to get more physical modeling of sounds, or uh, is that bad news for sound designers? No, um, I don't, I'm not saying necessarily physical modeling. Oh. Uh, physical modeling is cool, um, but more physics-influenced audio. So instead of having randomness, have um, explicit selection of wave files based upon yeah. physics parameters. Um, and, and again, really limit the kind of randomness. Um, also, I, I would love if we had ra you know, Gaussian randomness, not just yes. uniform randomness. Yes. That would make things a little bit more realistic. Um, like overtones? Overtones, yeah. yeah. Um, so wh what kind of physical, can, can we do a combination of wave files and, right, as you hit something harder, <coughs> um, more energy gets put into the system, which means you have more modes of vibration, which means more high frequencies. So are there kinds of harmonic distortions that we can do on existing waves that's influenced by the physics of the game engine so that when you have a collision, you the tools make it so easy. Whenever you have a collision between objects, you always take advantage of the, the force of the impact of the collision. And right now, yeah, we can do it. It's just a little bit of a, you know, let me stand on one foot and hop around in a circle to get it to really, um, really easily happen. It should, should be a little more automatic. Now, physical modeling, obviously, is the next cool step, um, which a guy has obviously talked about in, in length at uh, previous things. That's a good question. There's a good example in the, the WISE Audio Lab, the sample that can be downloaded with WISE Reflect about using physics and early dynamic early reflections. And we, I, I made it on purpose to, for the weapon sound to have just one sample, no randomization on volume and pitch and so on, and just moving in, in the room, you get different time delay based on where you are. Right, so and, you and that, so it, for me, it's more a perpetual random container going on than an accurate system to localize sounds. That's a like great... Like the benefit point. of it. Is so, right, so uh, the benefit is you're kind of getting your infinite variation, your physics-based, physics-influenced audio, PIA, um, kind of for free, but, well, for free by using, doing lots of math. Um, yeah. So maybe, uh, maybe John was right. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> solved. Um, just solved problem. Audio is <laughs> basically done. No, that, that, that's, that's such a great point. Um, Great experience with um, at Microsoft with just that thing. The researchers were trying to do full modeling and, and synthesis, and they just showed me that trick of oh, we're randomizing the uh, overtone series, overtone spectrum of a, of a given sound. Mm -hmm. And I was like, let's put just that in. It was super cheap, and the randomization was far more realistic than a bin of random sounds. Right. And if you could tie that to a physics parameter of impact amount, you could you know, have it scale up and down the number of, of uh, harmonics that it plays. So, yeah. Anyway. So, again, it's a matter of making the tools make these, all these things right. nice, and, nice and easy That's to use. Um, I was at Game Sound Con and somebody mentioned, you know, casually in the conversation, like, wow, the game audio tools are really bad. 
you know, my first instinct was to take this person by the neck and like drown them just because, you know, I remember the days where you had to write assembly language to make a noise and wait two days to hear something. It's like the tools are amazingly good now. But at the same point, I'm like, he has a really good point. You know, the, the, the flow, every, every bit of, you know, every little hurdle you have to jump over is an, an impediment to doing some cool experimentation and iteration and getting your creativity higher. And that's why I'm really excited about things like the Oz Wise Authoring API. It's like as we can merge these tools and lessen the number of steps by integrating things into game engines or things like that, that that'll go a long way to, to fixing things too. Well, we're a little bit over, so I better stop. Thanks very much for coming out this morning.